Before closing our discussion of uh, frequency domain methods, I wanted you to take a look at a page from a book written by Nichols with two others in the 1940s, where his chart appeared for the first time. I told you that the constant contours, that is contours that correspond to various constant values in the dB gain versus phase shift plane are not simple circles. They are curves which look somewhat like ellipses, some of them others are open curves and so on. So this is the so called Nichols chart that I wanted you to see. Now let us uh, move on. I hope by this time the expression frequency domain method is uh, clear to you. The Nyquist criterion of stability, the method of drawing the asymptotic Bode plots, M circle, N circle, Nichols chart, compensator design using networks, all of these are based on frequency domain methods or concepts. That is, one is thinking of a sinusoidal function as a typical input function and then finding out what would be the response to that kind of an input. And therefore, one talks about gain, either absolute gain that is ratio of output amplitude to input amplitude or dB gain 20 log to the base 10 of the absolute gain and phase shift or phase difference between the output and the input. Earlier to that we had looked at the root locus method which made use of the concept of transfer function and poles and zeros of the transfer function. There is no specific mention of any particular input like the sinusoidal input or even the unit step or the step function input. Although from the control point of view, one of the things that one likes to study is the effect of disturbances and a simple kind of disturbance which occurs very often is a sudden change from one value to another value and this is therefore thought of as a step input or a step disturbance. But apart from that, we did not really look at any other or any specific inputs. We looked at the transfer function, the poles and the zeros of the transfer function and then the idea of a characteristic polynomial or a characteristic equation associated with the closed loop system its factors or therefore the roots of the characteristic polynomial and their location in the complex plane were all the ideas that we were led to. Evans's root locus method of course has stability investigation as one part of it. Now what kind of method is that? It is not a frequency domain method. It is not quite what is called a time domain method, which we will look at very soon. It may be called a transform domain and specifically because the transform is the Laplace transform and the preferred symbol for the complex variable there is S, it may be called an S domain method. So then we have had S domain methods, the root locus method was a particular example of that. Then we had a look at the frequency domain methods and now we will take a look at what can be realistically called time domain methods. In a way in control system study, the time domain methods are or should have been the most natural methods to use. Why is that so? because the earlier control systems going back to the time of the astronomer Airy and the problem of tracking the stars or James Watt's governor or the steering of ships that is before servo mechanisms and 
feedback amplifiers came on the picture, the system to be controlled was described by one or more differential equations involving derivative. And so, the system description itself was as one could put it in the time domain. You wrote down the differential equation which involved some parameters of the system and that is what we did for our simple motor speed control problem. Subsequently, in order to deal with the differential equation making use of some other work or some other areas of mathematics such as the theory of the Laplace transformation, Fourier series analysis and Fourier transforms and so on, people were led to methods like the S domain method of which the root locus method is an example or the frequency domain method which preceded it of which the Nyquist criterion and the Nichols chart based design are examples. In recent times and it is not really that recent, nearly 40 years ago investigators went back to the differential equations for several reasons. One of them is that the differential equations that led to concepts like transfer function, frequency response were linear differential equations and time invariant differential equations or as I used an abbreviation earlier ordinary linear differential equation with constant coefficients. The Laplace and the Fourier transform methods could be used concepts like frequency response could be used for such differential equations only. We saw some properties of the Laplace transformation and the first of the properties that we saw was that the Laplace transformation is linear. The Laplace transform of the sum of two functions is the sum of their Laplace transform. The Laplace transform of a scalar multiple of a function is the same scalar multiple of the Laplace transform. And the third property of the Laplace transform of course, concerned the derivative of a function. There is no simple theorem regarding the Laplace transform of the product of two functions. That is if I have two functions f and g and I look at the product f times g, then there is no nice and simple expression for the Laplace transform of the product of f and g. It is possible of course, to write an expression for the Laplace transform of f times g in terms of the Laplace transforms of f and g separately. But that is a relation which is not very convenient to exploit. Of course, for the Laplace transform of the convolution of two functions, this idea I had briefly mentioned. The convolution operation is denoted by a star usually. So, the Laplace transform of the convolution of two functions, of course, has a nice alternate expression, namely the product of the Laplace transforms of the two functions separately. But in the description of the system, the convolution operation does not occur usually. A product may occur, but not a convolution. So, the user Laplace transform approach was restricted to linear ordinary differential equations with constant coefficients. The Laplace transformation method cannot be used in general if the system equations are not linear the system equations one or more are non linear that is one case where the Laplace transform method will not be applicable. Another is with regard to this part of time invariance or with constant coefficients the Laplace transform method cannot be used if the system is not time invariant or specifically therefore, the system is time varying. This may happen because there are coefficients what look like coefficients which multiply derivative terms which are time varying. So, sometimes such equations are referred to as differential equations with time varying coefficients. 
So, if the differential equation is nonlinear, if the differential equation is time varying or if it is both, then the Laplace transformation approach will not work. Neither will the frequency re response approach work. For example, if the input to a nonlinear system, a nonlinear differential equation, say, is a sinusoidal function, the output or the response of the system in general will not be sinusoidal. And therefore, you cannot talk about amplitude of the input and amplitude of the output because although the input is sinusoidal, the output is not. So, the idea of gain is not applicable, phase shift is not applicable, which means you cannot do anything more in that direction. Now, of course, it is known or it was known that many systems can be modeled only if you are willing to consider nonlinearity or the time varying nature of the system. That is, there are many systems, some of them are have been known for a long time. By system, I do not necessarily mean a system which is a control system involved in a particular control application. I now mean here any physical system. So, nonlinearities cannot be ignored. It was known say even 100 years ago. And at that time also, people had tried to develop methods for handling systems with nonlinearities. You might remember a chapter on differential equations in your mathematics courses where you may have looked at and solved some specific nonlinear differential equations which give rise to or gave rise to some different kinds of functions. For example, Bessel's functions. They arise when you investigate a nonlinear differential equation of a particular type. But a simple example of a nonlinear system will be a pendulum. And this, of course, goes back to your early college days when one deduced the formula for the period of oscillation of a pendulum. 2 pi square root of L divided by G. That derivation made the assumption that the angle of swing of the pendulum was small. If the angle was called theta, then theta was small. And how small? Well, small meaning sin theta, which occurs in the differential equation, could be replaced by theta. So, the pendulum equation is actually nonlinear. Maybe you should write down that equation starting from first principles, consider a general position of the pendulum at an angle theta to the vertical, look at the forces acting on the pendulum, the force of tension and the force of gravity and the resultant force being the force that accelerates the pendulum. And you can then write down the differential equation for the angular position theta. And you will see that it is nonlinear. So, there were physical systems as simple as a pendulum for which it was known that the description is nonlinear. The pendulum can be described by an equation which is nonlinear, although approximations can be made. Now, after the success of the S domain and the frequency domain methods in the 40s and 50s, there arose some problems where you could not work with such approximations to nonlinear systems or it was no longer acceptable to make those approximations. The requirements for precision had increased tremendously and therefore, interest went back to the study of differential equations. Now, in this context, first of all, let us see exactly what we mean by a nonlinear system. Now, there are two ways of defining a nonlinear system. There is one way which is a little abstract in the sense I do not write down any particular differential equation and then say that it is linear or it is nonlinear. 
but rather I consider the differential equation and as we saw for a physical system or a differential equation that describes a physical system, you have something called an input, something which you can vary over which you have some control and some other function or variable called the output or the response which you do not directly manipulate or control, you do it through the system. So, one can think of a system as a relation between inputs and outputs. Very crudely we say input produces an output or this is a response to that particular input. So, I do not even have to say that okay, there is a differential equation there, there is some differentiation action taking place or what have you. This is sometimes referred to as a black box approach to a system. There is an input variable, there is an output variable and there is something which has been put together such that I can change the input and I will get a change in the response. This is a very broad concept of a system. What is inside? How do I describe it? Are there resistors, motors, pipes, whatever? Of course, for a given practical situation, I have to know what is inside. And that is why I said this is an abstract approach. We will concentrate only on the input and the output and the relationship between the two. Specifically, each particular input produces some definite output. With this concept of a system, one can define linearity quite easily. And in fact, when we talked about the Laplace transformation and its linearity or the two properties, something exactly like this was being done. In other words, you have let us say an input u1 which produces a response, let us call it using control literature c1. So, u1 is the input corresponding output is c1. Suppose we apply some other input u2, it results in a different output c2. Now, if the system is such that applying u1 plus u2 produces a response c1 plus c2, then we say that the system is additive or we say that the system obeys or satisfies the superposition principle. So, this is one part of linearity, additivity or the superposition principle. Note that we do not apply two inputs together. What we apply is we apply input u1 look at the response, then change the input to u2, look at the response and then go back and apply a new input u1 plus u2, the sum of the two inputs and see if the response looks like the sum of the original responses. The system still has one input, one output. Now, if for some choice of u1 and u2, this fails to happen, then we will say that the system is not additive or the system does not obey the superposition principle. So, this is one part of linearity or correspondingly one part of non-linearity. A system is additive or a system may not be additive. A system obeys the superposition principle or it may not obey the superposition principle. The second is of course, the scaling property or homogeneity. Here what do we think of? Again one input let us say one output and of course, as some of you who will go further from this course will realize that when I say one input, I can think of several inputs as one vector input. Similarly, when I say one output, it need not be only one variable, it could be a whole set of variables being considered together. So, a vector input and a vector output that is also possible. So, I apply input u, I get a response c, then I scale it by some factor lambda, do I get an output which is also scaled by the same factor? If this is going to happen, then the system is homogeneous or has this scaling property. And if a system has both additivity and homogeneity, then we say that the system is linear. So, if we say that a system is nonlinear, what we mean is that one of these two properties or both of these properties do not hold. Now, this does not require you to know what is inside, although very often to find out 
whether a system has this property or not, you will have to know what is inside. But on the face of it and in a very simple way, you can sort of make an assessment whether a particular physical system is say homogeneous by applying some input to it, observing the output, then doubling the input, seeing whether the output is doubled. If the output is not quite double of the original output, then the system does not have the homogeneity property. Similarly, you could check additivity sort of experimentally. Something has been put in a box and I have only an input and an output which I can measure and observe and these are the things that I do with the input and output. In principle, I can find out whether the system is additive or homogeneous or linear or not. Of course, I may scale it by a factor of 2, the output may be doubled, but if I scale it by a factor of 10, I may find that the output is not 10 times. Why does this happen or when this happens in what cases familiar to electrical engineers can this happen? You have a magnetic field which is produced in the presence of say iron, a particular current produces a particular flux density, you double the current, the flux density may get doubled, but if you scale the current by a factor of 10 or 100, the flux density may not get scaled by the same factor. And so we call this phenomenon the phenomenon of saturation. So if a device shows saturation, then certainly it is not homogeneous. To go back to the example of the pendulum, scaling the swing of the pendulum, of course that is not quite a system, but a large swing and a small swing, things are not necessarily the same. Now, of course, if you are not going to follow this kind of an experimental approach to find out whether a system is linear or not and you look at the description of the system that is what is inside and you write down a set of equations, then how do you find out from them whether the system is linear or not? This concept of linearity is more familiar to all of us because we encountered that fairly early in fact, in school itself, when one talked about simple equations which were called linear equations or linear algebraic equations. And the simplest of course will be simply say the equation y equal to ax, say x is the input, y is the output, a is simply some coefficient, a scale factor and if this is the description of a system and do not think that there is no system for which a description as simple as this is possible, a potentiometer or gain coefficient implemented in some physical way is exactly of this kind. Output is just a constant multiple of the input. Now, is this linear? Is this additive? Does it have the homogeneity property? Well, from the description we can determine without much difficulty that it is so. So, let the input x1 produce the output y1 which means y1 is equal to a x1 the input x2 produces the output y2, so y2 is equal to a x2. So one input produces one output, another input produces another output. Think of the sum of the two inputs as being applied. So the new input is now x1 plus x2. What is going to be the new output? The new output is a times x1 plus x2, but that is the same as a x1 plus a x2 but ax1 is y1, ax2 is y2. So the new output is the sum of the two outputs. So this system or one can even say now because this we may not think of a system, we may think of the equation itself. This equation is additive, has the property of additivity. Similarly with regard to homogeneity, if x1 produces y1 and therefore y1 is equal to ax1, what about lambda x1, what will it produce? Well, the output will be a times lambda x1, but this can be rewritten as lambda times a x1 or equal to lambda y1. So if the input is scaled by lambda, the output is going to be scaled by lambda. So the system or the equation is homogeneous and therefore the equation is linear. 
this is how in fact we learned to use the word linear or we learned to recognize equations which were said to be linear. Notice that we can talk about a system being linear and an equation being linear and the two are not quite the same. We can take another example and see that an equation can be found out to be not linear or non-linear. Take the simple equation say y equal to a x squared, x is the input, y is the output. Such a thing could be called a squaring device or a power law device with power law 2. And again, there can be some physical system for which this is a good model, y equal to ax square, squaring devices. Is this equation linear? Is it additive? Is it homogeneous? Now, one can quite easily verify that it is not so. For example, homogeneity, so x1 produces y1, where y1 is therefore ax1 square. What is the output for lambda x1? Lambda x1 produces what output? Lambda x1 produces a times lambda x1 whole squared, but this is a times lambda square x1 square or it is lambda square times y1. So, scale the input by lambda, the output is scaled not by lambda, but by lambda square. So, the system is not homogeneous or the equation is not homogeneous. Similarly, you can verify that the equation is not additive and therefore, when we see an equation like this y equal to x square, having gone through this experience, we see that no, this equation is not linear, whereas the equation y equal to a x is a linear equation. So, this is how we learn to recognize that this was our first exposure to linearity and nonlinearity. Of course, a system may have two inputs, it may have two outputs, the relationship may be more complicated, but again one can by working out see that the system equation or description is linear or not. So, let me take an example of a system with two inputs and two outputs and this kind of a description of course is already familiar to you. Two inputs x1, x2, two outputs y1, y2 and they are given by two equations of this kind and as you know one learns to write this in a more compact form or it is not really compact, but it leads to very new ideas in the form of a matrix of coefficients. Here are the two outputs y1, y2 now put together as a single vector. So, I think of y1 and y2 as one, but with two parts y1, y2, x1 and x2 as one with two parts x1 and x2. So, here is the input, here is the output and here is the matrix of coefficients that is involved in the relationship. Now, it is a simple exercise to find out that when the two inputs x1 and x2 are given some values and you have corresponding outputs then you change the values given to the inputs, find out some new outputs and then superpose them, then what happens? It is easy to verify that additivity holds, that homogeneity holds. Therefore, this set of two equations or the input output relationship given by these two equations is also linear. So, one linear equation, several linear equations, one recognizes it by the appearance of the equation. One need not worry about what physical system is it for which this equation is a good approximation or holds and so on. So, linearity of the equation rather than linearity of the system, this is something also, in fact, this is what one learns earlier. Linearity of a system is a more advanced and as I said, a little more abstract concept. Now, just like linear algebraic equations, you have learnt to recognize linear differential equations. For example, the differential equation and I am going to use the dot on the top of a variable to denote derivative. We have also seen earlier other ways of indicating a derivative of course, d by dt is the first method or way of denoting a derivative, but I have also introduced the symbol capital D as denoting the operation of differentiation. So, I can write down an example of a differential equation which is linear and we will verify that it is linear, although by its appearance you know that it is linear. So, let us say we have an output variable y. So, 
somehow in the system description its derivative appears. So, y dot equal to let us say a y plus b u, u is the input, y is the output. In the description a derivative of y appears, y dot equal to a y plus b u or if you wish d y by d t equal to a y plus b u or d acting on y operating on y equal to a y plus b u. So, let us say this is the description of a system. Is the system linear or the way we are going to find out is not by giving inputs and measuring the outputs, but by looking at the system description or equation. So, is this equation linear? How do we find out? Well, we apply exactly the same kind of test. Consider an input u 1 corresponding output y 1. So, since y 1 is the output, what must be true? d y 1 equal to a y 1 plus b u 1. For an input u 2, suppose the output is y 2. Therefore, d y 2 must be equal to a y 2 plus b u 2. So, u 1, u 2 are two inputs for which the corresponding outputs are y 1, y 2 and these two inputs and outputs satisfy these two equations. So, now we think of an input which is the sum of the two inputs. So, u 1 plus u 2, what is the corresponding output? Let the corresponding output be denoted by y. So, I have to find out what is this y and I am going to ask whether this y is equal to y 1 plus y 2 or not. If I can show that it is y 1 plus y 2, then I have shown that the system or the differential equation is additive. But what, what equation does y satisfy? y is the output for input u 1 plus u 2. Therefore, d y must be equal to a y plus b u 1 plus u 2. Right? So, this is what I have d y equal to a y plus b into u 1 plus u 2 and I have the two equations for y 1 u 1 and y 2 u 2. From that now I have to try to find out or try to show whether y equal to y 1 plus y 2 or not. And you will see that there are some conditions or assumptions which I had mentioned earlier do come into the picture now. I will write down the equations for y 1 and y 2 below. So, I have a y 1 plus b u 1 and d y 2 equal to a y 2 plus b u 2. So, these are the three equations for y 1, y 2 and y inputs u 1, u 2 and u 1 plus u 2. Now, the appearance of the equation suggests that we can do the following. We can subtract from the first equation the second and the third equation. So, if I do that, I will get d y minus d y 1 minus d y 2, d y minus d y 1 minus d y 2 equals a y minus a y 1 minus a y 2 and what happens to u 1 u 2? Well, there is b u 1 here that cancels with b u 1, b u 2 cancels with b u 2. So, there is no u 1 u 2 appearing in the equation. So, I have this equation and since I am asking whether y is equal to y 1 plus y 2, let me call the difference between y and y 2 or y 1 plus y 2 z. And so, I am asking the question whether z is 0 or not. Well, we almost have an equation for z. We have the equation d y minus d y 1 minus d y 2 on the left hand side equal to a y minus a y 1 minus a y 2 on the right hand side. Now, we make use of a property of the derivative operation which in turn is a linearity or an additivity property the derivative of the sum of two functions is the sum of their derivative or the derivative of the sum of three functions is the sum of their derivative or the derivative of the negative of a function is the negative of its derivative. The first two are examples of additivity, the third one negative being minus 1 times the function is an example of homogeneity. So, here we are making use of the fact that the derivative operation is linear and therefore, d y minus d y 1 minus d y 2 can be written as d of y minus y 1 minus y 2. And on the right hand side I have a y minus a y 1 minus a y 2. So, I can write this as a multiplying y minus y 1 minus y 2 or since I have called this z, I have d z is equal to a z. 
So, what is this difference between y and y 1 plus y 2 may be the z satisfies the equation d z equal to a z. Now, from that does it follow that z is equal to 0 for all time t? The answer is no, because we know the solution of this simple differential equation. You remember in our discussion in the beginning, we saw or I reminded you that a solution of this differential equation, a general solution of this differential equation involves the exponential function. So, the solution is actually z t equal to k times e raised to a t or by putting t equal to 0, we can see that z t is equal to z 0 into e raised to a t. So, z t is equal to z 0 into e raised to a t and therefore, z t is not 0 unless z 0 is 0. Now, this is something that brings us to an important uh, consideration which we had seen earlier reference to initial condition. That is when we say that this differential equation is linear, we will have to say in addition that under certain initial conditions. For example, what does it mean to say that z 0 is equal to 0? Well, z 0 is actually what y 0 minus y 1 0 minus y 2 0. So, this must be equal to 0 and one simple way in which this can be made 0 is by making all of them 0. So, in other words now we have to say that okay, I am going to look at the differential equation y dot equal to a y plus b u, but I will consider it only under the condition that the initial value of the response is 0, y 0 equal to 0. So, under 0 initial conditions, I will study or I will look at the differential equation. For one input, I get one response, for another input, another response. In both cases, the initial value of the response must be 0 third input u 1 plus u 2, third response again the response must be put to 0 in some way or the other. If that is done, then the system is additive or the differential equation is additive. And of course, when you use the Laplace transform approach, one sees that more explicitly because in the derivative property of the Laplace transform, the initial value makes its appearance. So, the differential equation is additive with this restriction, is the differential equation homogeneous? Now, you can see that that also is going to involve this assumption of the initial value being 0. So, dy is equal to a y plus b u with input change to lambda y is the response or let us say d y 1 equal to a y 1 plus b u, the response to lambda u is y. So, d y is equal to a y plus b into lambda u is the difference y minus lambda y 1 equal to 0. If I call that difference z, then I will get the differential equation d z is equal to a z once again. And this has the solution 0 only if z 0 is 0. So, it means for homogeneity to hold also the initial value of the response must be equal to 0. Of course, we saw earlier that when we did the Laplace transformation technique that you could talk about components or parts of the response. That is the response although physically it is not a sum of three separate things mathematically or in our model we can think of it as coming in coming from three different parts or two different parts. If you remember, I talked about 0 input response and 0 state response. Response when the input is 0, but because the initial conditions are not 0, you get a non-zero response. On the other hand, the initial conditions are made 0 and input is applied, you get a component of the response. What I am talking about right now therefore, is the 0 state response under initial conditions being made 0 the relationship between response and input is linear. Of course, one learns very quickly to recognize a linear differential equation like this as an equation which looks like this. In fact, this is how students answer the question or for them the concept of linear is the appearance of the equation and not input output relationship. 
Of course, this can be extended to several differential equations in involving only one input or more than one input and this is again something which your control theory book has a lot of discussion of. For example, I may have two outputs, one input and a relationship which looks almost like what we wrote. For example, dy1 is equal to a11y1 plus a12y2 plus b1u dy2 is equal to a21y1 plus a22y2 plus b2u or by combining or thinking of the two y1 and y2 together as parts or components of what is called a vector, I can write this as d acting on y1, y2 equal to a matrix again a11, a12, a21, a22 acting on y1, y2 plus b1, b2 multiplying u or u multiplying b1, b2 or to use a further compact notation this can be written as dy and one may sometimes underline y to indicate that this is not one but this is several like y1, y2 equal to some symbol that denotes this matrix a fairly standard symbol is capital A multiplying the vector y plus again a symbol for the vector consisting of b1 and b2 which is multiplied or scaled by u and therefore b u although this u is a scalar multiple so usually it is written in front of b but in control literature this is a fairly standard way of writing. So this is in fact a linear model of a system with one input with maybe two outputs in this case or this y may consist of three components or whatever. So again one recognizes by the appearance of the equation that the equation is linear. It is not so easy to show that something which does not look like this is in fact non-linear. For example, let me write down the differential equation y dot equal to a y square instead of y dot equal to a y or y dot equal to a y square plus let us say b u. So there is an input u, there is a response y and there is this differential equation or using the d notation d y is equal to a y square plus b u. Now you will say this does not look like a y plus b u therefore it is non-linear. Now that would not be a good answer or a really a correct answer because I would like you to show that this is non-linear because homogeneity fails or because superposition fails. So you have to give me an example of an input and a corresponding response and a scaled version of the input the response fails to be the corresponding scaled version of the output. You must either give an example or by looking at the equations and by manipulating them you must be able to show to me that this is the case. For example, if I choose an input y1, if I choose a response y1 corresponding to an input u1, so I have this equation and then I talk about scaling, so the corresponding response let it be y equal to a y square plus b into u1 is now lambda u1, then I have to show that y will not be equal to lambda y1. For that I will have to manipulate these two equations somehow and show that the difference between y and lambda y1 is not 0. Now in this case it is not too difficult although it as you will see it does involve some trouble. So going by what we did earlier I will take this equation and from that I will subtract lambda times the first equation and calling the difference y minus lambda y1 equal to z then I will get d of z equal to a y square minus a y1 square because the u1 term disappears. And from this now I can express let us say y in terms of y1 and z. So if I write this as a y is z plus lambda y1 minus a y1 square and so dz equal to this of course is squared, so I will get dz equal to az square plus something something. Now I have to show that this equation 
does not have a zero solution, even if the initial conditions are zero. Now that, in general, it's not easy to do. In other words, in general, if you write down some equation which looks nonlinear by having square terms or by having, say, sine of z and terms of this kind, the solutions of that equation are not very easy to obtain. That does not mean that the solution is not 0 or 0. So, it requires a lot more effort to show that the particular equation is linear or is not linear. What therefore, you have learnt is to recognize linear equations, what is nonlinear is not simply what does not look like what is linear, unfortunately. To show that something is nonlinear, you have to do some more work and show that homogeneity does not apply or superposition principle does not apply. I will not press this point any further, but I did want to emphasize that a system being linear and nonlinear or failing to be linear is one thing, a differential equation failing to be linear is another thing. And the main point is that you can recognize something as being linear, but by its form, by its appearance, whereas there is nothing like an appearance of a nonlinear system. For example, dy equal to y square is nonlinear, dy equal to y cube is also nonlinear, but that is not all, dy equal to sin y is also nonlinear and so on. So, in other words, there is nothing like a general nonlinear model. Whereas, there is something like a general first order linear differential equation model. The model that I have written earlier dy equal to a y plus b u is a very general first order linear differential equation model. And this is the reason why nonlinear systems are very difficult to study because there is no particular form that they all of them have. Whereas, all first order linear differential equations by their very choice have a particular form that is why we recognize them as linear and therefore, they can all be studied together. Nonlinear systems unfortunately cannot be all studied together. So, there is no general statement that I can make about all nonlinear systems. Whereas, I can say something about all linear systems described by a first order differential equation. This is why the study of nonlinear systems has proceeded more slowly, has been very difficult, and therefore, the S domain and the frequency domain methods were applied to linear systems and were developed quite well before people went back to the study of nonlinear systems.